We are live and we are doing today this uh, wonderful session, of course, presented by Dr. Philippe Durek. He is the pragmatic web security. This is how he describes himself and of course, a web security expert. So today we are on the defender track and we are going to do a presentation presented by him on securing uh, APIs in an ecosystem with zero authority version 2.0. So I will pass uh, uh, I will pass the turn to Dr. Philip, of course, uh, for everyone who wants to pose a question, of course, in the uh, Q&A session, they might do that through the Hoover platform. We'll be happy to answer your questions. And uh, I will be happy to pass my word to Philip. Philip, I wish you all the best and good luck with your presentation. All right, thank you very much, Angela. And she'll be back uh, afterwards with some questions. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just drop them in the, the app and they'll appear in the list and probably be asked at the end. So you can grill me towards the end of this presentation. All right, welcome to the Defender track. We're going to talk about how to build more secure applications. And I want to talk about how to secure your APIs with OAuth. And I'm going to take you on a journey on I'm going to start with things we're not going to talk about just to set the picture uh, to make things straight. And then we're going to uh, walk through a whole bunch of takeaways on what to do, which techniques to use, which parts to use, uh, and how to use them in practice. All right, let's dive right in. And let me start by saying what we're not going to talk about. So what you have in, in this whole ecosystem is a lot of complexity because OAuth is, has been around for a while. It's about 10 years uh, this year, so it's about 10 years old, which is quite a long time for technology, and it has evolved quite a bit. And on top of OAuth, well, people started using OAuth for all kinds of, well, not weird things, but all kinds of things it wasn't designed for, such as user authentication. And a while ago, like also a long time ago, I don't know the exact date for this one, but a while ago, um, the people building these, these standards and specifications said like, you know what, let's, let's build, people need this, so let's build an authentication protocol on top of OAuth. And that's OpenID Connect. And in OpenID Connect, uh, a client application can basically go to an authorization server to an identity provider and ask information about who the user is. Like, can you authenticate this user for me? And it will return information about the authenticated user. Whenever you use something like sign in with Google or sign in with Apple or one of these things, or your enterprise login is very likely OpenID Connect as well. And OpenID Connect has nothing to do with API security. So now that we know what OIDC is, it uses OAuth under the hood, but it doesn't do anything for API security. It's only for offloading user authentication. That's what it does. It's a whole different use case, just using a similar underlying technology as we use for accessing APIs. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about OAuth actually. OAuth is what we really wanna talk about and where we wanna to go to. And OAuth is about accessing APIs. So a client, an application, can be a backend web app, a third-party backend web app, can be a mobile app, can be a front-end web application, or even an app that doesn't involve users at all, can go to that authorization server and basically ask like, hey, I would like to access this API uh, on behalf of the user or as a client application. We'll talk about that later. Can you make that happen? Can you give me something to actually go to the API and be like, hey, I'm this client. I would like to uh, handle this or send this request and the API can process that. And that's OAuth. That's OAuth. That's an OAuth flow is going to run, which results in a token, an access token. And that access token allows those clients to access APIs, sometimes on behalf of users, sometimes just as the client. That's uh, different use cases. But it's basically that access token gives the client the authority to contact the API, to access the API. And the API will use that access token to make authorization decisions. And that again involves, that's the third leg of the triangle here, that authorization decision at the API side, that involves interaction, either explicit or implicit with the authorization server. The API will either have to ask help from the authorization server, like, can you help me figure out what this means? Or the API can just use metadata from the authorization server to uh, validate an access token on their own. And I'm going to talk about that later as well. So that's the picture. OIDC, just offloading user authentication. OAuth, the complex part of OAuth is mostly getting that access token, so the left part of the triangle. And then we have these other two legs in the triangle that's also OAuth, uh, a little bit less complicated, but still uh, very important to get right. Otherwise, you can imagine you'll have massive authorization issues in your APIs. All right, that's the picture that I want to talk about. Why on earth would you want to use OAuth? Because it, when it's so complex, like why, why would I want to use it if it makes my life harder? Well, it actually has a very nice feature and, and you can see that in this image. That's why I kind of like this image, even though I made it myself, I still like it quite much uh, because it shows you 
that the clients and the APIs are sort of decoupled from all of the dirty details of having to interact. The client just uses an access token to contact the API. And an API doesn't really have to worry about how to authenticate a specific client or how to authenticate a specific user or how to handle these details. That's what the authorization server does. The authorization server does all of the heavy lifting here and basically gives an access token representing that metadata to the client, which sends it to the API. And that's the abstraction that OAuth offers. And that allows you to build like flexible uh, architectures, uh, decoupled architectures, scalable architectures, and so on and so on. All right. Before we dive into more details, let, let, maybe let's, let me make this a bit more concrete. Like, how does this translate to real world applications? And I know we all have different backgrounds. So I'm going to use an example that everybody knows. Even if you don't use it, we're going to talk about Twitter. This is totally fictional, by the way, because Twitter doesn't use OAuth at 2.0, but whatever. Uh, just imagine that they do. Doesn't matter here. The authorization server, that glue holding everything together here is Twitter. Twitter offers a developer platform. They, they use OAuth 1 and some parts of OAuth 2. It's, it's a bit weird, but Twitter offers a developer platform. That's what matters. Where you as a developer, can you can build a client and then register it with Twitter. So you can tell Twitter like, hey, here's a client application. I'm going to register it, set it up so it can later come to you, ask for an access token and so on. In this ecosystem, the APIs are Twitter APIs. We're basically building a client that would like to access a Twitter API, maybe on behalf of a user, maybe on behalf as a client, as a client directly. So what are the client applications? Well, whatever you want, basically. One type of client is definitely going to be Twitter's frontend. Twitter's own frontend applications are OAuth client applications. They go to that authorization server like, hey, I'm Twitter. I would like to access Twitter. And well, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. The authorization server is like, oh, yeah, of course, you can do that. And uh, the client can access the APIs on behalf of a user. Because if I log into the client, I give that client permission to access Twitter's APIs on my behalf. So Twitter can do Twitter things and make tweets happen, basically. A lot of Twitter, Twitter tweets going on here. What other clients do you have? Well, there's undoubtedly mobile apps. Twitter has their own mobile apps. I'm going to add another bird on the slide. To, we have enough birds now. But mobile apps can be uh, clients as well, or you can have services as a client as well. For example, you can build a, a standalone application that, that's not used by a user, but just collects statistics every day. It could go to Twitter and be like, give me all tweets from today with the hashtag OWASP uh, vir global virtual app sec. That would be one way of, of using a client. That's not on behalf of a user. You're not accessing a user-specific timeline. You're just sending a request to Twitter directly as a client application. And you still want to have that access token because Twitter's APIs are not open. You still need to be a registered client before you can contact the APIs. All right. <clears throat> Third scenario, that backend client. Backend web applications can be OAuth client applications, which is kind of a, a weird terminology, but once you get used to it, it's, it actually makes perfect sense. So what would be a good scenario here? Well, Buffer. I'm using Buffer. Uh, you may have seen that I, I tweeted out the link to the slides on Twitter. Uh, if you are on Twitter, then you may have seen that. It's not like I was tweeting live right before the session. Uh, I actually like to be calm and <laughs> relaxed before I start speaking. So what I use is I use Buffer, a social media scheduling tool. So I basically, I have a Buffer account and I've linked Buffer to Twitter. Uh, that's the, the, the left uh, top arrow. Uh, Buffer has access to Twitter on my behalf. And that's a backend web application. So the Buffer server knew that at uh, 10.55 local time, they had to send out a tweet. So they uh, contacted Twitter's API and were like, hey, can you post this tweet uh, on Philip's timeline? And here's an access token to prove that I have the authority to contact, uh, to handle that operation on behalf of Philip. And then a final part of this picture. <clears throat> yes, I can talk a long time about a single slide. A final part of this picture is that you also have API to API communication. So let's say that there's internal communication between APIs, not necessarily on behalf of a user, but just inter-service communication. Those APIs can become clients and consumers of access tokens as well. So API to API communication is often implemented with OAuth as well with access tokens. All right, that brings me to the first takeaway. The first takeaway, I'm going to have a whole bunch of these uh, takeaway slides here. The first takeaway is use OAuth and OpenID Connect as intended. So sometimes people get confused like, what do I use for what? OpenID Connect is only for user authentication. If you're not dealing with users, if you have a client, a machine-to-machine -machine access scenario, OIDC is meaningless. It doesn't make any sense to use OIDC. So OIDC is about user authentication. OAuth, on the other hand, is about enabling a uniform authorization framework so you can access 
protected resources. That's the official terminology, but in practice, it's likely APIs. In modern systems, that protected resource is an API. So OAuth is about getting that access token so you can access APIs. OIDC is about getting information about the user. All right, that was the introduction to my session. Let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Philippe Dreck. Uh, thank you, Angela, for the host, uh, for getting my name right. That's not often that that happens, so that's absolutely awesome. And I run a company called Pragmatic Web Security. And through Pragmatic Web Security, I basically uh, deliver in-depth security training to developers. So I, I actually just finished a two-day workshop in, in Sweden, and I flew in this morning right before my talk. Uh, I'm back home now, so uh, I made it on time, so that's a good thing especially with airports these days. So I do online training, uh, online training, on-site training, online training, and also help companies uh, figure out how to approach security best practices and designing their applications in a secure way. All right, what else? I'm a Google developer expert and Azero ambassador. These are like a community outreach programs of, of these companies. So they recognize the efforts I'm doing with giving presentations like this one uh, and so on and so on. So uh, I'm not employed by Google or Azero, I'm just, uh, I'm part of their DevRel programs and so on and so on. And I organize a course in Belgium called Sec Up Dev, which actually starts next week, Monday. So in three days. Uh, so I'm pretty busy with that as well. And that's a week-long course on AppSec with speakers from all over the world teaching their expertise to our attendees. All right, enough about me. Let's talk about APIs. Let's talk about APIs, clients, and access tokens. <clears throat> On this slide, my question becomes, where does that access token come from? Well, from the authorization server. That's, that's an easy question, right? Where does it come from? Well, obviously from the authorization server. I mean, we talked about that before. The, the better question, that's not a good question, actually. The better question is, how do you get the access token from the authorization server? It's like, ah, that depends on what you're building. It depends on whether you're building an application used by users like Buffer going to Twitter on my behalf, or an application that's accessing APIs directly, like collecting tweets with a specific hashtag without acting on behalf of the user. And let's talk about the second scenario first, machine-to-machine -machine access, a client accessing an API without users involved. You just set it up, configure the client, and the client can now contact the API directly whenever it wants to do whatever it needs to do. And here's how that flow works in the OAuth world. So that flow is called a client credentials grant, because the client is going to the authorization server with its credentials, typically an ID and a secret, and it's going to ask that authorization server for an access token. Like, hey, I am the hashtag collector client. Uh, you know me because somebody registered me before. Can I get an access token to access the APIs, please? And the authorization server will verify the details, typically return an access token if everything checks out, and allows that client application to access the API with that access token and get the tweets from that API. This is... As simple as it gets, that's the simplest OAuth flow we have. And that is the one we use for machine-to-machine -machine access. Scenarios that do not involve users. And we call this the client credentials grant because we're exchanging client credentials for access tokens. That's what we do. Takeaway number two, the client credentials grant allows machine-to-machine -machine access. Why do we have it? Because it absolves the API of the responsibility to have to figure out how to authenticate the client. You can have like 20 of these clients and they will all go to the, to the authorization server, get their access tokens and send them to the API. So the only thing the API needs to know is like, how do I handle this access token? And how do I make authorization decisions with that access token? I will get to that later in this session. We still have half an hour to go. So uh, that detail will be covered soon, I promise. All right, that was easy. So let's get to the hard parts. What happens when a user is involved? Well, when a user is involved, things get a little bit more complicated. As in, well, that's a lie. They get a lot more complicated because the user talks, uh, communicates with the browser and we have to loop in the browser and we have a bunch of redirects going back and forth. And that makes things kind of challenging. Here's what that means in practice. Let's imagine a scenario with a backend web application as a client, Buffer and Twitter. I am logged into Buffer and I want to connect Buffer to my Twitter account, give them permission to access Twitter on my behalf to post tweets. So I'm going to click a button somewhere that says connect my Twitter account or my LinkedIn account or my Facebook account or my, Inst well, I'm not on Instagram, so I, I don't have an Instagram account. Yes, I'm that old, I know. 
All right, so you click that button and that's gonna initialize the flow. So the backend is the client, the backend is in control of starting that flow. So the backend will basically initialize that OAuth flow with a redirect. So it responds to the browser with a redirect response, which will take the browser to the authorization server. Goes to the authorization server, the URL contains all the dirty par parameters. I'm not gonna talk about those, but it tells the authorization server who the client is, what kind of access they're requesting and so on and so on. And the authorization server, maybe recognizes that user. Step three can carry a cookie. In that case, the authorization server, Twitter may know like, oh yeah, you're Philip Dijk. I, I know you from before because of your session cookie on step three. If there's no such cookie, if there's no active session, then Twitter is gonna be like, who the hell are you? I don't know who you are. And it's gonna ask me as a user to authenticate to Twitter. Like log into your Twitter account for me. Philip Dijk, password test 1234. Not my real password, by the way, so don't try it out. Um, that's what I do. And then Twitter is going to ask me, that's an optional step, the consent step, but it's in this case very, very uh, recommended. It's going to ask me like, hey, Philippe, Buffer is asking permission to read your tweets and write and create tweets on your timeline. Are you sure you want that? And I, as a user, can think about that and be like, mm, yeah, that's okay. Yes, I approve. All right. Next, the authorization server is happy. It's like, okay, the user, I know that it's Philippe. I know Philippe approves of Buffer getting access to his Twitter account. So awesome. I'm going to create a one-time code called the authorization code and send that back to Buffer. However, we can't send it back directly. You have to go through the browser of the user. That's how this thing works. So it's going to respond with a redirect again, which will take the browser to an endpoint hosted at Buffer.com. Buffer.com slash callback or something like that. And in the URL that's being loaded, there's a parameter called code, and that code contains that authorization code. So the backend web application can now read that URL parameter, extract it from there, very easy and straightforward, and go back to the authorization server in step seven to exchange that authorization code for client uh, for an access token. And that's what happens right here. All right, with that access token, you can kind of guess the next step because that's the whole point of using OAuth that the API side only deals with access tokens. So now Buffer can go to the API and be like, hey man, create a tweet, please. Here's an access token. API looks at it and it's like, sure, why not? And that is how this flow works in practice. We're exchanging in step seven, we're exchanging an authorization code for tokens. So you can kind of guess what the name of this flow is. It's the authorization code grant. And then if you wanna know more details, we use a mechanism, an additional mechanism called Pixie proof key for code exchange, which I'm not gonna explain here. It's a client specific thing that you have to implement there. Just know that you have to use Pixie if you wanna use this flow. All right, takeaway. User-based access scenarios rely or use the authorization code grant. I know there's other OAuth flows, but they are deprecated. You don't use them anymore. Like the implicit flow is off limits. The resource owner password credentials flow is off limits. Everybody uses the authorization code grant with Pixie. Mobile apps, front-end web apps, back-end web apps, all of them. Awesome. Now, let's think about that buffer scenario, right? Buffer is accessing Twitter on my behalf, but if they, I have, actually I have another presentation in, in two hours uh, for a, a different event, also online, so kind of easy. Um, what if I also tweet, I have a tweet scheduled for that event. So what if that tweet goes out and Buffer goes to Twitter and Twitter's like, yeah, man, that access token is no longer valid. What do we do then? Well, Buffer could send me a mail and be like, hey, Philippe, uh, can you come back to Buffer and click that button again so we can run that flow and get a new access token? But that would not be very user-friendly because I'm probably not gonna see that mail until it's too late. But in the previous image, you may have seen that when Buffer exchanged that authorization code, they also received a refresh token. And a refresh token is a token that gives you or gives the client long-term access and allows the client to get a fresh access token with a refresh token. So the client can request a new access token in this case. The authorization server will verify that refresh token. And if everything is valid, it will provide a new access token with a new lifetime, valid for another 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, uh, so that the client can now go to the API again and post a tweet when necessary. That's what a refresh token does. It provides a client long-term access without the need to involve the user in that process. It also enables you to keep your access token short-lived, which is a best practice. If you can keep your access tokens short-lived, like five minutes, 10 minutes, that's a good practice because the client can always use that refresh token to get a new one if necessary. And short-lived tokens reduce the window of abuse in case somebody would steal a token and abuse a token. All right, good. 
I also have pitfalls, like slides in, in bluish backgrounds with green letters. That's a good slide. That's a takeaway. Pitfalls look a bit more ominous, uh, like a dark gray background and some reddish text. Uh, still readable, though. <laughs> Full red was not readable. So a somewhat readable red text. And a pitfall here is that people often misuse tokens in this whole OAuth stuff. Like there's access tokens, refresh tokens, identity tokens when you use OpenID Connect, and authorization codes. And people get confused. And sometimes they start sending identity tokens to APIs or accepting them in APIs and all of that stuff. Absolutely, horribly bad idea. Don't do that. Remember, APIs only consume access tokens. That's what an API does. It accepts an access token, nothing else. No identity token, no refresh token, none of that. Remember that. Use the tokens for their original purpose, not for other things, because it seems convenient. It's probably, it is probably convenient, but it's also a very bad idea because it will result in authorization issues on the API side of things. All right. So enough pretty pictures, right? I know I like, I make nice PowerPoint graphs, but we are developers. We're in the builder or defender track. So you want to see things in monospace font. So here's an access token, two access tokens, actually. On the left, you have a reference access token. And on the right, you have a self-contained access token. Two tokens representing the same authority, just in a different format. So what is this all about? Let's talk about the reference access token first. A reference access token is actually a random identifier that is meaningless to everyone except the authorization server. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I lied about no pretty pictures anymore. I have more pictures to explain how these things are going to work in practice. So what does that mean? The client is going to get an access token by running that OAuth flow, depending on what client you're building, and it's going to get a reference access token. And with that access token, it can contact the API just like before. And that token means nothing. It's a random identifier kind of comparable to a session ID. It means nothing. So the API now has to go back to the authorization server and be like, hey, man, I got this random token, this access token. I don't know what it means. Can you help me translate that? And the authorization server will look up that token in its list of tokens in its data store and like, oh, yeah, that token is associated with Philip for the buffer client and so on and so on. Here's a set of claims associated with that token. And we call that token introspection. The API has to translate that access token to claims at the authorization server. API can't do that on its own. And what's, the, what's the, the, the setup here? Well, whenever the client sends another request, so a bit later, the client sends a second API request in step six, the API gets that same random token. It's like, I don't know what that means. And the client has to do step seven again and get the response in step eight. And it happens over and over and over again, which sounds heavy, which it is heavy. But there's one major benefit of having reference tokens. And the major benefit of having such reference tokens is that you can always terminate a token whenever you desire to do so. When you are in the need to prevent a client from accessing the API any further, you can go to the authorization server as an administrator or through a user interface if that's provided and terminate access immediately. That access token will be revoked. And the next time the API goes there to introspect that token, instead, uh, I have to count here uh, 10, that would be, or seven or four. And that token is revoked. The authorization server is like, oh, no, 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 that's no longer valid. And the API or the client will not have access to that API anymore. So that's the, the upside. That's the benefit of reference access tokens. The downside is the cost. It causes overhead because every request on step three and six, that side results in a request in step four and seven. So it's security at the cost of performance. You can kind of guess where we're going with this, right? So reference access tokens, that's good. It's highly secure, but highly uh, much overhead. So what about self-contained access tokens? Well, self-contained access tokens are JSON web tokens mostly. JSON web tokens, and it works like this. The client is going to obtain that token, and it's going to get that JSON web token, that self-contained access token. And with that access token, the client makes a request to the API. And the API can now verify the signature extract the claims from the token, everything is embedded in the token, and make its authorization decision. Awesome. No introspection required. And when a client sends another request in step four, guess what? The API can do the same, and the same, and the same. 
The API can now independently verify the validity of the token and use the claims for authorization decisions because it's all embedded in the token. Awesome. Sure, there's a big upside. Performance is a lot better. No constant back and forth between APIs and authorization servers. The downside is that we can't really revoke a token anymore. Well, the downside is somewhat nuanced. You always can revoke refresh tokens because when the access token expires, after 10 minutes, let's say, the access token is no longer valid, the client has to go back to the authorization server with that refresh token. And at that point, the authorization server can be like, no, the user said you no longer have access, so you don't get a new access token. Bye-bye. No access for you. So refresh token revocation is always possible, but for the duration of the lifetime of an access token, revocation is typically not possible unless you build like additional uh, non-OAT specific infrastructure to support that, which is a whole different story. So that means if your tokens are valid for 10 minutes and somebody steals a token, there's going to be a potential window of abuse for 10 minutes. Of course, if your tokens are valid for two weeks, then well, you can see where this goes. Then you have a potential window of abuse of two weeks. The trade-off here is revocation versus performance. What does that mean in practice? It means that highly security-sensitive applications, financial app, e-health apps, they are willing to pay the cost and, have, and use reference access tokens with token introspection. For them, it makes perfect sense to accept that cost for security. However, for most applications, the recommendation of having short-lived self-contained access tokens is good. That offers a good balance. It gives you the level of control you need, five minutes, 10 minutes, that's acceptable for most applications. And it gives you the performance and flexibility you need as well. So that's a good trade-off in practice for many applications. All right. So how do we make authorization decisions with access tokens? I'm going to make a promise. I'm not exactly sure. I don't know every slide by heart, but I kind of guess we're through with the, the arrows and the pictures. So let's talk about the claims in access tokens. All right. On the left, we have the claims you obtain after token introspection. So the client goes to the authorization server, like, what does this mean? That's the response you get. A bunch of JSON claims, key value pairs, basically. On the right, we have the same, or not the same, similar claims, but the claims that are embedded in a JOT-based access token, like in a JSON web token. And you can see that there are some similarities, but also some differences. So let's talk about those for a second. The first thing is the introspection response will have an active claim, which is true or false. And your developers, your defenders, you build stuff, you know how a Boolean works. Like true means this token is active, false means it's expired, it's revoked, it whatever. We, we no longer consider this to be a valid token. That's the thing on the left. That's what you check when you get such a token. Well, an introspection response, at least like, is the active claim true? If yes, move forward. If not, we will reject 403 probably and go away or 401, whatever you want. On the right, we have an EXP claim. EXP means expiration timestamp. It's a timestamp when a JSON web token becomes invalid. That's that five minute, 10 minute timestamp since the creation of that token. We also have additional time-based claims in JOTS. We have IAT, issued at or NBF, not before, uh, which can also play a role in making sure that the token is valid. All right, one down. What else do we do? Well, we want to make sure that the access token is applicable to us, which means it has to be issued by a service that we trust. In this case, I'm using the one for my uh, restaurant review demo application, Restograde, and it's running at sts.restograde.com. It could be running at auth.twitter.com or whatever. That's the issuer. That's the party that has created this access token. Is that the expected party? If we're a Twitter API, we likely only accept tokens from Twitter's authorization server. So we check that issuer is pointing to that specific authorization server. Additionally, we check the audience claim, AUD. Audience means which API is supposed to consume this access token. And this looks like a very strict identifier, but it's, it's just a string. So you can put whatever you want in there as an identifier, but it's basically the API knows its own identifier. Like, hey, I am API 7, and it's going to look, does the audience contain API 7? Yes, it does. Awesome. This token is intended for me. If it says API 3, then API 7 should be like, what? Why the hell are you sending me a token for API 3? No, I don't want that. Out. That's what the audience claim does. Awesome. I'll actually add some text for reference later on as well. 
Finally, if you want to, this is not, this is very optional, but if you want to, you can also look further in the access token and you might find, it's not necessarily there, but you might find claims that identify the client to which this access token was issued. Could be a client ID claim, can be an AZP claim. This is somewhat custom to every implementation on how they represent that. And this would allow the API to decide like, oh, it's this client making a call. Do I want to allow that? Yes or no. Most of the time, you don't need client-specific authorizations, so the API doesn't have to look at this, but there might be cases where this does make sense. All right, takeaway here is the first thing your APIs have to do is make sure that the access tokens are acceptable, as in that they're valid, that the active claim is true, that the signature is valid, that the issuer makes sense, that the audience makes sense, and so on, and so on. And when you've done that, you know that you now have a valid access token. So let's talk about how to make authorization decisions. What do you check next? That's a good question. In the access token, you may find, there, there's like nuance here, may find as in the OAuth spec is full of optional. So. Yes, it may be there, maybe it's not there. It depends on how you interpret things, how you build things, what features are supported, and so on and so on. But there may be a scope claim. So what does a scope mean? A scope represents the authority that has been granted to the access token. And this is typically authority granted by the user. So imagine that on Twitter, I have full access to my Twitter account, right? I can access my private messages, I can access my tweets, I can write tweets, I can change my profile and so on and so on. But a buffer client only has, requires a limited set of these permissions, like read my tweets and write my tweets. So buffer can request a specific scope when asking for an access token. They can say like, hey, Twitter, I would like to have write access to uh, a timeline. And that scope allows me to give consent like, yes, I grant buffer write access and allows me to delegate a partial set of permissions to a specific client. That's the idea behind the scope. It gets somewhat more vague and confusing in actual implementations, but that's the true idea behind the scope. And you'll find that once you know what that means, you'll find that everywhere. For example, Zoom, if you want to add a Zoom meeting to your uh, calendar, your Google calendar, you'll get this pop-up from Google saying like, hey, Zoom would like to have access to view and edit events on all your calendars. Oh, out and scopes. That's a scope requested by Zoom so that they can create events in your calendar, update events, see when, when you have a Zoom meeting, and so on and so on. And as a user, you your Google is asking your consent to do that, and you can choose continue or cancel. I chose cancel because I only did this first screenshot. I don't use a Zoom Google Calendar integration for anything. So uh, but that's how consent works. So what, what, other, what other scopes does Google have? Well, they literally have thousands of scopes. If you go look for Google OAuth scopes, you'll find this page with like hundreds of APIs. And for each API, they have this list of scopes that are available. For example, on, on the left top, top left, you can see Gmail scopes. And you can find one interesting one a bit down. Let me see if I can highlight that very professionally with my PowerPoint pen. Uh, you can see one Gmail read only. That scope gives a client read only access to Gmail, allowing a client to request the minimal necessary set of scopes to perform its functionality. Let's say you build a productivity tool that gives you like daily statistics of your Gmail activity. Probably the most depressing tool you can build, but sure, whatever. And it's going to say like, oh, you sent so many mails today, you got so many mails, and you have this many mails left in your inbox, like probably a few thousand, something like that. A tool like that would never re need write access to Gmail. It doesn't require access to send mails or create messages or delete messages or whatever. It just needs read-only access. So with this kind of scope definitions, it can request read-only access. One example of how you use scopes in practice, and for that matter, a crazy example because Google has like a massive amount of systems available. Maybe a less structured example, maybe a more re realistic example as well is GitHub. GitHub also has a bunch of scopes because you can use OAuth to access GitHub accounts. And you can see that they, their scope definitions grew a bit more organically. Like you have some things with colons in between and some things with underscores, which is perfectly fine because scopes are just strings. But you can also see how it translates to delegating certain authority to a client. Like, hey, I can give a client access to uh, get status of repositories or to uh, get user information or to send notifications. All of those things are individual scopes. 
In an API-based world, we can tra translate that concept to functional level access control. Like if you're building an API, Twitter, and you want to allow a client to write tweets, you would perform functional level access control by checking, does this client have the permission, the scope to create or to write data on the timeline? That's checking proper functional level access control. By the way, a big thing in the OWASP API security top 10. Remember that. Sometimes scopes are not good enough. Scopes have this... Well, people have a love-hate relationship with scopes, and sometimes you want to have some something more fine-grained with a different meaning, and you'll often find the use of custom permission claims. Many implementations actually support a claims called permissions, where you can add permissions based on an authorization policy. For example, uh, you can configure your, uh, your authorization server and say like, hey, these users always get these permissions, or these users have the, the admin role, and by definition, they get these permissions, or this client gets these permissions, and so on and so on. And that's an authorization policy you define at the authorization server, which allows you to include specific scope or specific permissions in an access token, which the API in turn can use to make authorization decisions. That's essentially what this is all about. All right. So what's the takeaway here? If you need a bit more flexibility, if you want to uh, include authorization information that is based on a policy, then scopes are probably not the right mechanism, but you might want to look into using such a custom permission claim. That's a recommended approach. That's an, a, a frequently used approach to get that information to an API so that the API can make authorization decisions. Awesome. We talked about functional level authorization. But do you know what number one is in the OWASP API security top 10? Well, you should know. And if you don't know, you should look it up and learn what it is. It's broken object level authorization, not function level, but object level authorization. So how does that work? Or what's the problem here? Well, it's a problem that has been around since forever because I'm, I've been using this slide for like four years and, and a bit um, because it just happens everywhere and it's always the same story. In this T-Mobile story, what happened is that you could access your account information by sending a request to their backend using your phone number as the identifier. Your phone number is kind of unique, so why not use that as an ID, right? And T-Mobile checked if you're authenticated. Like, are you an authenticated user? Yes. Okay, here's your account information. Good. Makes sense. But they forgot to check if the, if the phone number you provided belonged to your account. They just used the phone number, looked up the account info, and returned that info. Which means if I do it for my account, everything is perfectly fine. But if I do it for your account with your phone number, they would check if I'm authenticated, like, yes, I am, as me. And they would return your account information just like that. Not good. That is a bit of a problem. That's broken object level authorization because we forgot to check that the object being accessed is allowed to be accessed by this particular user. And this problem exists everywhere. We had a story from a bit later from a patient portal, healthcare information, very sensitive, millions of people exposed. Twitter had an issue where you could associate phone numbers with user accounts, and Facebook had an issue where you could uh, change the name for any Facebook page and then register a new one with the same name or with the old name and take control of people coming to that page. So a lot of very similar problems, and they exist in virtually every API out there today. Why am I talking about this? Well, because you have to perform object-level authorization checks with access tokens as well. Here's an example of a user-specific access token. A user-specific access tokens, they can always contain an SUB claim. An SUB is a three-letter abbreviation for subject. It's basically a claim representing the user associated with this access token. And it's a user ID that is the value of that claim. So in this token, we have two things we use for authorization. We have the permissions claim, which allows us to do function level access control. Like, can the user access the endpoint that returns review information? Yes, they have the reviews read permission. Good. Can the user access this particular review? Well, let me check, because let's use that user identifier, compare that to the author of the review, make sure they're the same. In that case, this is the user's review. Yes, they can access that review. That's how you use this in practice. So we basically rely on that user's identifier, which is unique in that uh, authorization service ecosystem. So that identifier will always be the same and will never change and will be unique, immutable. 
And we use that to ensure that the object being accessed is indeed allowed to be accessed by that user, which can be simple, like comparing IDs of the user versus the author, or it can be a bit more complex. For example, checking if the user belongs to a restaurant or a shared project to which the review belongs or whatever. That's an authorization policy that's specific to your application, and that's not something we can discuss in detail right here. But we have to be aware that we have to perform these object level authorization checks. That is absolutely critical. And if you mess that up, things are going to end badly and you'll suffer from OWASP API security top 10 issue number one. And trust me, almost every API does at some point in time. What do we do? when we need more information to make authorization decisions. Like you'll often find multi-tenant scenarios where you have users, sure, but the user belongs to a tenant, a customer in your application. And you have like a bunch of tenants and each tenant has a bunch of users and you'll need that tenant information, that customer information to make authorization decisions. So the question becomes, how do you solve that? Can you include that in the access token? That's a good question. Like maybe. And actually, yes, you can. It's not maybe, yes, you can. So first of all, access tokens, they perfectly well support custom claims. So an access token, there's no problem for including a tenant ID or tenant name or the name of your dog or whatever in the access token. That's perfectly legal and perfectly possible. The main question is, is it a good idea? Do you really want to include an information in your access token? And which information is okay to include and which information should we probably not include? And there's no rules for that. There's only rules of thumb, like experience guidelines, but that's the best we have at this point. So first of all, we can include additional metadata. A, a good guideline to decide if it's something you want to include in an access token, yes or no, um, is to think about whether the custom claim you're adding is associated with the user's identity. Because the access token represents the authority of a client to act on behalf of the user. So user-specific information, sure, we can include that. API-specific information, like probably not. That's something we shouldn't do. So in this case, a tenant ID is something that belongs to the user's identity. That's a core part of who the user is. So yeah, if the authorization server has that information, it can perfectly fine, it's perfectly fine to include that in the access token, allowing the API to make authorization decisions based on that tenant ID which I just noticed is the same as the user ID. That's a PowerPoint copy-paste mistake. I'll, I'm going to fix that in the future. So it's supposed to be a different ID in this case. What shouldn't you include? Well, API-specific authorization details. You shouldn't be mimicking API authorization policies at the authorization server so that the authorization server can include it in access tokens. That's going to be a recipe for problems because it will tie your authorization policy of the API to the authorization server. It will make it very difficult to update something. It's going to be a nightmare to keep that in sync and so on and so on. So user-specific information or user-associated information, sure, API-specific information or details, not, not good. So the pitfall here, gray and red, the pitfall is that you want to avoid overloading the access token with details. So you shouldn't be replicating API authorization policies at the authorization server so you can include them in claims and then use them at the API. That's not a good idea. Limit the information to user-specific claims, making it possible for the API to enforce their own authorization decisions. And that brings me to a last point in this session. Whenever you use information, and a common example is that tenant ID that's often present in tokens, whether it's a tenant ID or a customer ID or a whatever, that's a value that's often present in tokens. However, depends a bit on how you design your API, but you'll often find that information in other places as well. So here's an example from a Spring Boot application. And you can see on line two that the path, the, the, uh, the URL to access the API also includes a tenant ID. It's a parameter present in that URL, it's a path variable. So you have slash tenant slash some ID 17 slash restaurants, and we get the restaurants for that specific tenant, and it makes perfect sense. And that's often a path variable or a query parameter or whatever. And you'll find implementations like this one that use the tenant ID 
from that URL. But in that case, in this case, we have a bit of a problem. Because you might assume that the tenant ID is trustworthy because yeah, it's, it's a user's tenant ID and it's also in the access token and it's perfectly fine. But if you never check that, then an attacker can change that tenant ID in the URL and potentially bypass authorization checks. In this case, there is no authorization check. The API in this case mistakenly assumes that the tenant ID is trustworthy, but it's really not because it's request data and it can be tampered with. So what you have to do in this case, if you want to design an API like this, if you want to use that tenant ID in, in the part of the API, you have to match that against the tenant ID in the access token. You have to ensure that the ID in the URL is the same as the ID in the access token. That should be a generic authorization check. And only then can you move forward and retrieve the information for that specific tenant. Because if you don't, then you have an authorization bypass and you have a problem. And this seems very logical in, in a PowerPoint slide with only three lines of code. It's like, yeah, duh, of course. Trust me, in a real API endpoint, this is actually quite common. In a real API implementation, you'll often find these vulnerabilities uh, because it's very easy to make a mistake like this, very easy to overlook something like this. So the pitfall here is don't use untrusted values for authorization. Use trusted values, check them. If you use them from there, first check them against a trusted source to ensure that they're valid before you actually use them for something in the system. And that brings me to a slide with key takeaways. Three takeaways to summarize this entire session. First of all, use OAuth to enable authorization in a complex architecture. OAuth and OIDC have totally different purposes. OAuth is about clients accessing APIs. OIDC is about clients getting information about an authenticated user. Two separate things using the same underlying flows and mechanisms. Learn and respect the purpose of these OAuth flows and these tokens. People often fail to fully grasp the details of a flow and then don't really understand how to use it. And they often ask me like, yeah, but what if we just change this and that and send this there? And more often than not, it results in potential vulnerabilities. These flows are extremely complex. The security of these flows is handled with formal models because people can't think of these attacks. We actually have to ask computers like to make sure that this is safe. And when people do that research, those formal models, they pop up and say like, hmm, we found a scenario where something can go wrong. And people look at that and like two hours later, probably they're like, huh, that's a good one. Crap, we never thought of that. So please be aware that this is extremely difficult to do yourself. So you just use the flows and respect the flows and their meaning. And then finally, enforce API authorization using information from the access token, using the steps we talked about here, the active claim, the signature, the expiration, the issuer, the audience, and then functional level and object level access control. All right. With that, I want to mention that I have additional material on, on web security. If you want to learn more, I have some online courses that you can definitely take a look at. Uh, there's a free course on OAuth and OpenID Connect containing a lot more details. So that's something you definitely can look into. And there's courses on API security and React security as well. With that, I want to thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the session and feel free to connect with me on social media. Twitter and LinkedIn is the best platform, well, the only platforms I'm on. So um, join me there and follow me uh, to stay in touch on security. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, our wonderful host is going to pick them up from the app and will ask me about them in the next few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip, as well. This was a wonderful presentation, especially for us that are researchers. You really gave us insight on the matter and you really gave us a few advices that I'm sure me at least will put into practice. So let's uh, jump a little bit on the Q&A session. I'm happy to tell you that we have a lot of feedback and also a lot of questions. People are really interested in the subject and they really want to know your opinion on a few matters. So if we'd like to continue, uh, Christopher Major is asking how best to use OS2 tokens in the machine to machine context. And he's also asking the same token for each service to service is bad. So a new token exchange for each service to service adds a lot of overhead. Uh, zero authentication too does not support requesting all tokens front up. 
All right. So in the machine to machine access scenario, you basically need regress tokens. So a client, let, let me maybe jump back to, to the slides because, well, that's mm -hmm. going to make things a little bit more clear. And we have that ability here anyway. So uh, let's let's go for that. So basically, the so, idea is uh, whenever we require a different access or permission in this scenario. Yeah. So there is, in, in theory, there is a way to request a token. You could say like, hey, I want an access token to contact API 1, 2, 3, and 4. But that's that's kind of a best practice. That's that's a bit of a, a, a best no, a bad practice, a bit of a bad smell in in systems because access tokens should be um, should follow the principle of least privilege. Like you should make them as as tiny as possible um, to avoid any risk or harm in case an access token gets compromised or stolen or abused in one way or another. So in this case, you would request different permissions or different scopes within an access token as long as they belong to the same API. So let's say you want to contact three APIs. In this case, the recommendation would be to request three access tokens, uh, one for each API. And of course, inside an access token, you can have multiple permissions for one of these um, one of these APIs. So that's fine. So API one can have read and write permissions. That can be a single token. It would have a, a token for API two and a token for API three. So that's essentially how, how this would be approached in practice. And the principle here is, is not different than with front-end applications or, or uh, user-facing applications. Um, the client can request certain permissions. The authorization server can um, automatically grant certain permissions uh, based on a configuration policy, and the token just represents the authority of the client. Thank you very much. I hope that answered your question. Also, I'd like to jump to another question from Nathan Britton. He says, uh, he asking that, would you recommend an API getaway in front of your APIs to do the token validation in the scenario exactly that you described where a stolen token could be used maliciously? Hmm. Um, yes, and that that's actually a, a tricky question. Like. Let, let me start with the first part. Yes, API gateways are absolutely useful. So in, in a full architecture, um, you would probably have an API gateway sitting in front of there, which would perform some rudimentary upfront checks like, hey, is there an, a valid access token attached here? And so on and so on. However, you can't really move your full authorization checks that we, we talked about into the API gateway because that would basically mean that the API gateway will have to start enforcing API specific authorization. And that's not recommended because if you have five APIs behind one gateway, then the API gateway would have the authorization policy for all the APIs. And that, that would just be way too fine grained to do that in practice. But an API gateway could be like, hey, you're sending a request to API one, I'm gonna check if your access token actually has the audience API one. Because if it hasn't, you know what, get out. You don't, I don't, I'm not even gonna forward this because it makes no sense. So yeah, you could reject things at that level, absolutely but it's always going to be a cooperation between both to enforce proper authorization. So the API shouldn't rely on the gateway, like, yeah, yeah, the gateway will handle everything for me. No, the gateway can be a first line of defense, but your APIs should always handle their authorization checks themselves as well. Maybe some duplication, but that's going to give you a secure design that avoids any bypasses. Thank you, Philip. Uh, throughout the presentation, you gave us reasons uh, why we should use uh, authentication for APIs. But uh, Joran Norton is asking, when should we not use OAuth for API authentication? <laughs> um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, that's, that's a hard question to answer as well. So I would say OAuth is overkill if you let me jump back to this slide. If you, let's take Twitter as an example. If the only scenario would be that you have one front-end client accessing a Twitter API and nothing else, like no additional clients, no third parties, no uh, API to API access, none of that stuff, then OAuth is probably overkill. Then all you need is a way to authenticate a user and maintain a session of that authenticated user, and that's all you need. And as much as people hate to hear it, it actually works in such an application. It works kind of quite well with server-side session information, like a J session ID. That is the perfect way to get that done in a small, non-distributed application that just works. That would be the, the simple step. However, if you have multiple clients, multiple APIs, if you want to kind of decouple the responsibility to for every API to know how to authenticate clients and users and that stuff, 
then you're gonna have to build like a, an external authentication service somehow. And before you know it, it evolves into something that looks a lot like OAuth. And at that point, you're just rebuilding OAuth. So the advice is if you want to decouple your clients from your APIs and make it easier for APIs to make authorization decisions with a uniform structure, OAuth is a good approach. If you want to build like a, a very scalable system, if you have millions and millions of users, or you plan to have millions and millions of users, um, this would also be a good idea because keeping track of sessions yourself is not going to work well. And authorization servers are actually built for use cases like that. So I would say if you run into those needs or expect to have those needs in the future, then this is definitely um, the right approach. It's a standardized approach. It's, it's what everybody else is doing. It's definitely not going away anytime soon. Um, nobody's going to drop support for that. It's, this is definitely uh, the way forward. Thank you again, Philip. And we would like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was very insightful. For everyone who wants to follow Philip on his media platforms, you can find uh, the details shown on his slides. And thank you everyone for taking part in our beautiful conference. Uh, I wish you could stay with us for the other for this track and for the other sessions that we have uh, today. And I'd like to thank you, Philip, for having this wonderful talk. Hope to see you again. You're very welcome. Thank you for hosting us and enjoy the rest of the day to everybody else.